So who are you? Where are you in the world? I'm Rebecca Giblin. I'm somehow, I've ended up being a law professor at the University of Melbourne, where I'm also the director of the very fancy sounding Intellectual Property Research Institute of Australia. And I'm here in Melbourne, where we have seven seasons every day. And particularly today, maybe we're going to have about nine or ten. A little while ago, a podcast interviewer asked me for my creation story at the the beginning of something like this. And that really got me thinking if we're all superheroes or we're all going to become superheroes, what are the really pivotal things that took us there? For me, I've got such vivid memories of sitting under my grandmother's drawing table. She was a commercial artist working in the 50s and 60s and onwards in a man's world. She had no formal training, but she was the most incredible artist. And she would draw, she ended up making some like really famous labels. She worked for Cadbury and a a famous beer company here. She did things that millions and millions of people saw, but she never got any credit for it. I remember being under her table in four or five years old. And what does a five-year-old know about art? They know you write your name on that shit. (laughs) And I would always be asking her like, Nana, you forgot to write your name on it. Why aren't you writing your name on it? And she would say, I'm not allowed to write my name on it. And I think the other really pivotal part is I grew up in a house without books and I was always starving for something to read. These days, I understand that was my delightfully neuroatypical brain desperately searching out stimulation because we didn't have YouTube, there were no cat videos, and so I was reading all the time. But to get books, I needed to to go to the library and make friends with the librarians and go to the local charity shop where I would always seek out. I didn't have any money either, so I would always seek out the softest touch volunteer like you could always sense the the weakest one in the herd and then I would bargain really hard I'd get five books for four cents and I'd talk home with this big pile of ancient moldy books about boarding schools and ponies and so that the fact that I just I loved reading so much meant that and I was such a weird little kid and I didn't know how to people I didn't know how to make friends very well and so it felt like the authors were my friends and these worlds that I saw and like really got immersed into showed me that there was a different way of life to the one that I was in and I was I'm really inspired by that. I missed quite a lot of school when I was younger because it was very boring All I wanted to do was read my book, so I would race through the work, ignore the teacher, make quite a lot of mistakes, and just pick up my book and either read it obviously or surreptitiously. One of my best friends who's Finnish loves to tell people that I'm the only person she knows who has no primary or secondary education, just tertiary. I guess I figured out around year nine, so when I was about 14 years old, that I needed to get out of the sort of the place where I was living and I wanted a different life to the the ones that I was seeing around me. Uh, And I started studying really hard and that was agonizing because as I found out a couple of years ago, I've got ADHD and the boring things are very difficult, but I just kept trying. I failed a lot along the way because for a long time, like I wasn't really socialized when I was younger. I didn't know the things that, you know, you're supposed to know. So I did manage to get into law school somehow, which I was, I'd been working towards really hard, but I was living independently. I'd moved out of home when I was 17 uh, and it was a hard journey, but I got in. And what I, I didn't realize when I got there is that I didn't know all of the things that everyone else seemed to know. So I worked so hard and I finished with a very strong degree, but I hadn't realized that you're supposed to do clerkships uh, in the years before, which are like extended weeks long job interviews. And so I had these great marks and everyone said, but where are your clerkships? And the other thing I didn't know was how to do an interview. So because my marks were really good, I did manage to get some interviews despite the fact I hadn't done the one thing that you have to do to get a job as a baby lawyer. Uh, but I remember I, I I showed up to the fanciest firm and it was the managing partner who was there 
to interview me. And he started the interview by saying, I can see your transcripts. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of competition for you. And then we terminated the interview 10 minutes later by mutual agreement after we got into an argument about whether they treated their staff like battery hens, which I definitely initiated because again, I just didn't know the kinds of things that you were supposed to say. I very much needed a job. I was, I struggled very hard to get one. Uh, eventually though, I did I get a, a job article to the Victorian government solicitor. Um, this was my last best hope and it was decided way after everything else and I was so relieved to get that and it was an amazing place to to do that training I remember my first morning on the job I decided I wanted to be a lawyer because I think I watched some episodes of LA Law in the 80s and it looked fun so I decided that, that seems like a good job and I think I really loved when people you know spoke about lawyers or you saw lawyers depicted in popular culture I could feel that there was like some respect around that. And I really wanted to be respected. I wanted people to see me as more than just an insignificant piece of dirt. And so I'm pretty sure that's why I latched onto that. But then my first morning working as a baby lawyer and the deputy Victorian government solicitor um, walks up and he drops this file on my desk and says, can you draft a Cypre advice for the attorney general? And I said, oh yeah, no, absolutely. And he walks off and I use Ulta Vista to type, what do lawyers do? <laughs> I had no idea. It was one of the most like terrifying, but in retrospect, hilarious moments in my life that I had worked so hard to get to this thing. And I didn't even know what this thing was. Anyway, so I did learn a lot about what lawyers do in that year's apprenticeship. But there were five, there were five of us, Articled Clerks. And there were four jobs that were going at the end of the year. And I'd had amazing feedback on my work. Everybody uh, had been really happy with it. I knew I was performing at a high level. I felt really confident that I was going to get one of those jobs. And I went in to the meeting with the government solicitor and sat there confidently. And he said, I'm very sorry, you didn't get the job. And so this is after basically a year long job interview. So it felt like such a huge rejection. I was absolutely devastated. I remember walking out of that room, just feeling what well, they, they know me now. They, it's not just about my marks, right? They know me now. They know I do good work and they don't want me. And it was, look, it was absolutely crushing. And the reason again was, I guess at that point I was maybe 22, 23 and I still hadn't worked out how to interact with humans as humans. I was, I'm, I'm still very peculiar, but I was, I think, weird in a bit of an unsettling way because I just really wasn't very well socialized at that point. And that I didn't, I hadn't realized, I hadn't realized at uni that it was not about so much about studying at law school, but about meeting the people that were going to give you the opportunities later on. I only worked that out about five years ago, um, which is obviously incredibly slow, but that's one of the things that you get told if you come from a family that has been um, to these schools um, for generations and has relied on those connections. And, and I didn't know that it was about building those relationships at work so that people wanted to work with you. That was a really critical part of this as well. And obviously I think they made the right decision who were a lot of the clients quite liked me, but I think I, I was very non-standard in those interactions. Yeah. I just feel like I, I failed at getting the job in one of the big law firms, which was, that was what I'd aimed to do. I didn't want to do criminal law because that felt too close to home. This was too close to the background that I was trying to get away from, the people I was trying to get away from. It was a failure after I finally did get a job and showed them what I could do. And they said, we don't want that. And then I went away and I got a job in a, in a, a commercial law firm working in commercial litigation. And I, I tried really hard, but the people you had to work with, I, 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 for confidentiality reasons, I can't get too into this, but it was awful. It was an absolute nightmare and I was exhausted. And after three months, I just couldn't do it any longer. And after three months, 
three months in my like job as a proper lawyer, I quit. And again, absolutely devastating because I had worked so hard for this for so long and I didn't know what I could have next. I went home and I slept for three months as well. Like I was just so exhausted and so burnt out. And then once I stopped sleeping, I started to look around and be like, what else can I do? And at some point I was like, maybe I could do some tutoring at law school or something. Like I, I got really good marks at law school that could at least keep the wolf from the door. And so I put in an application to my old law school to do some tutoring work. And the deputy dean who's in charge of staffing calls me up and says, look, sure, you can have some tutoring work, but what you would really want to do if you're interested in that is a PhD. And I had no idea about PhDs or that you get a scholarship or that it's a job. And I was like, okay, thanks. I got, I, I put in an application. I got a scholarship and I found my tribe. I learned how to talk to people because I was around a bunch of other weirdos, but who were all really willing to accept me for who I was. But that gave me a chance to observe how other people do things and figure stuff out. And I ended up with this like extraordinary job that I have today where I have so much flexibility and freedom to work on things that really genuinely interest me instead of just constantly having to focus on the most immediate thing I need to get through in order to get to the next bit in order to get to the next bit. And every day I'm so incredibly grateful for failing into the place where I think I was always supposed to be. In 2017, Corey Doctorow was over in Australia for a book tour and we were doing an event together as well, a couple of events together. We'd known each other since 2013 when he'd helped an, an article I, write, I, I wrote go viral, but we hadn't really had very much to do with each other. And I just had this idea that if we did, if we did have a little bit more to do with each other, he would decide that we should be friends and then who knew what might happen after that. So anyway, we're in a taxi on the way back from one of these events and we start talking about our frustration with the, the copyright wars, which we've been just deeply immersed in for many years now. And this is that we get told to choose a side. Do we choose, do you want to help creators or do you want to help users? Is it about getting artists paid or is it about access to knowledge and culture? And the, we, we want both of those things, right? Everything has to be about both of those things. It is the same fight, right? Because if artists, emerging artists, don't have access to knowledge and culture, then what kind of art are they going to produce? But also if you're making knowledge and culture, but no one can access it, what even is the point? You're just screaming into the void. And so what we want is for copyright laws to do a better job of achieving those two aims and with much less collateral damage than copyright does at the moment. And so we were talking about how we both saw the problem as being about big, because if you've got big businesses that have too much control, then and then whether you're an artist or whether you're an audience member, all you're going to get is crumbs from the table, regardless of anything else. And so we, we had that real meeting of the minds and it was an amazing conversation. I remember just completely buzzing as I got out of that taxi. But then if we fast forward, fast forward a few years, it's March 2020. All of my work for the year, I had field work planned for New York. That's all cancelled. I'm locked in my apartment in Melbourne and, and Melbourne went on to have uh, some of the most brutal lockdowns in the world. And I decided instead of feeling trapped, I decided that this was a rare moment of freedom because often my work, I've planned it out for myself. You know, if you've got a grant application or something, you've got to say what you're going to be working on four years before you actually do it. But I got to just wipe all of that off and say, what's the story I most want to tell right now? And it was just so clear to me instantly. It's that story. It's how big business has captured creative labor markets. And it's about all of the things that we could do to take them back. And so I started working on it and I got uh, maybe three weeks in. And that was exhilarating, but so slow and so frustrating because I was just arguing with myself about things that this, the, the idea was that the book would cover copyright, but it would also cover so many other things. So I'm arguing with myself about stuff I don't even know about. And I just thought one day, this would be so much better if Corey Doctorow was writing this book with me. And I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I sent him an email. And here's the thing not many people know. 
if you email Cory Doctorow and ask him to write a book with you, he'll say yes. At least he did for me. He hates it when I make that joke, by the way, and he would insist I tell you absolutely do not write to me and ask to write a book with me because uh, that's not how it works. But it did work this time, even though his agent, who's like a really famous old school science fiction agent, he represented Arthur C. Clarke and Philip K. Dick still represents their estates now. His agent told Corey, yes, you need to write this book, but not with this random Australian. (laughs) But nonetheless, he did. And here we are. So what all of this turned into is this concept we've called choke point capitalism. What we realized is that in the capitalist system, competition is supposed to be central, except nobody plays by those rules anymore. You've got these Warren Buffett salivating over companies with what he calls wide sustainable moats. And what he means by that is barriers that stop anyone else from coming in and competing away those temporary, those market advantages. You've got Peter Thiel saying competition is for losers. The orthodoxy that's being taught in business schools is don't make anything, don't provide a service that people need, just find a way to position yourselves between customers and makers and siphon away as much as you can of the value that they're exchanging. And Amazon is the one who maybe made this famous. They talk about their flywheel and they've got a diagram of that, which we've adapted and put into the book. People talk a lot about why creators don't get paid, but much less about what we can do about it. I'm Rebecca Giblin. And I'm Cory Doctorow. In our new book, we do both explaining how powerful corporations create choke points that allow them to capture more than their fair share of value, and setting out a detailed plan about how to take it back. Let's start with Amazon. Amazon loves to boast about its flywheel, the secret of its massive success in capturing first the book market, then the markets for nearly every other kind of consumer good. Flywheels are spinning disks that store and release energy for machines. Flywheels are extremely heavy, so it takes a lot to get them to start spinning. But once they get going, it takes a lot to stop them. Here's how Amazon describes its flywheel. Lower costs lead to lower prices, which create better customer experiences, translating to more traffic, which then attracts more sellers and thus a better selection. That improves the experience even more, and the cycle continues. Amazon calls this a virtuous cycle. But it's not virtuous. It's anti-competitive. Here's what's really going on. Amazon's strategy has always been to lock in its customers. One way it does this is by putting digital rights management on ebooks and audiobooks, which cements readers to Kindle and Audible. Another is by offering fast free shipping to Prime members. Once you pay your annual fee, Amazon becomes your default whenever you need to buy something. Locking in its customers lets Amazon lock in its suppliers too. Publishers and small businesses can't afford to give up access to Amazon's increasingly large share of the market. So they keep listing their goods there, even when that's bad for their business long term. Amazon's lower cost structure is just a euphemism for shaking down its suppliers and workers. Amazon uses its market power to demand steep discounts and high fees from those other businesses as a cost of selling on its platform. It uses that money to subsidize low prices, which has the effect of eliminating competitors who actually pay fairly. As time goes on, that means Amazon suppliers have even less choice. Those low prices also lure more customers who then get locked into Amazon's platform as well. The shakedown grows more merciless and damaging as Amazon's flywheel spins faster and gains ever more momentum. Our new book, Choke Point Capitalism, shows how anti-competitive flywheels have become endemic throughout the creative industries. The result? Choke points. Hourglass-shaped markets with audiences on one side creators on the other, and powerful corporations squatting between them, extracting more than their fair share. 
If you're recording, publishing or distributing music, reporting news, making videos, writing books or writing scripts in Hollywood, or selling tickets for your live events, Chokepoint Capitalism is almost certainly making you worse off. In our book, we unveil the tricks big tech and big content use to capture creative labor markets, but we don't stop there. We also share tons of ideas about how to slow down those anti-competitive flywheels and provide the conditions that will allow artists, publishers, independent record labels, and everyone else who makes and invests in creativity to get paid fairly for their work. Now, this isn't just happening in Amazon. It's hap This is the same playbook that's being used across the creative industries. And we show it happening in the recorded music space for songwriters as well, for composers. And one of the examples that I thought was most interesting was in Hollywood, where we're supposed to be in the golden age of television, but the screenwriters were discovering that their share was getting lower and lower and their conditions were getting worse and worse. And what had happened is that the Hollywood talent agencies had consolidated into the big four, of which two of them were monstrously large, and they created these abusive practices that created all of these conflicts of interest. And, and that included things like packaging, where the studios now controlled all of the major talent, the writers and the directors and so on. And they said, instead of you just paying us a commission for finding you jobs, you don't have to worry about paying us commission anymore. We'll just get a packaging fee from the studios. But what that meant is that they were structuring deals to benefit the agencies rather than to benefit the, the talent. And what happened is instead of getting 10% of the fee, sometimes Meredith Steam, who was the writer on Cold Case, she showed that the studio for a long time was actually earning more than she was for her, her writing work on Cold Case. And so they decided to create this new code of conduct and to, to say that these conflicts of interest could no longer um, be accepted. And th 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 this was set up by the Writers Guild of America. We worked really closely with David Goodman, who was the, the president at that time. He's an incredible writer who got his start on The Golden Girls and went on to work on Futurama. He's got a, a new show called The Orville, which I think is pretty funny. We worked really closely with him and they they created this code of conduct and then they said, that's it. Any Anybody who does not sign up to that code of conduct, we won't work with anymore. And then in a single week, 7,000 Hollywood writers fired their agents. And that included people like Krista Vernoff, who was the showrunner on Grey's Anatomy. Her deal was made. She was really open about this, that she was doing just fine. She had enough power in the market as such a superstar that she didn't have to worry about this because she could negotiate terms that worked for her. But she said, hell no, um, I can see how the generations before me had all worked together in order to get the conditions that would support young writers like me when I was up and coming. And now I'm going to do the same for the people who come after me to make sure that this is a still a sustainable industry where people can work and have live with economic dignity. And so they they showed amazing solidarity. It was really hard. And we we spoke, we checked in with David regularly over the course of the strike, and you could feel what a toll it was taking on him. 22 months it took before they actually managed to finally get the last agency to roll over and agree to get rid of these abusive practices. And it was amazing, actually. Um uh, when we had the the U.S. launch day, uh, we had an event in Hollywood and David was our interlocutor asking the questions. Um, and one of the things that he said there he, that really stuck with me is that we the, we, the writers, thought that the agencies had more power than they actually had. But eventually we noticed that they only had the power that we collectively would give them. And that when we were working together, we a Hollywood without agents still works, but a Hollywood without writers grinds to a halt. And that was just incredibly powerful to as a reminder that when we do work together, absolutely we can change things. 
the only way we've got any power at all. We need to demand that our politicians and policymakers give us laws that actually get creators paid, that actually protect their rights, that actually ensure that we've got reasonable, legitimate access to knowledge and culture. We need to go out on the streets and demand that. We need to go out on the streets and demand that workers have um, an entitlement to a fair share of the resources created, the value created by their labor. And that's where the fight has to be. So we need structural solutions and we need to give up on this feeling of paralysis that we so often feel like the same way we're told to, the same way we're not ever gonna be able to recycle our way out of climate change. We're not gonna be able to fix these worker issues um, through individual action either. So let's give up on that idea that individually we're gonna fix this and let's go out there collectively and demand real change.